Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to Benson Memorial United Methodist Church. Uh, not the first Sunday of the year, but our first Sunday back in the sanctuary during uh, 2023, and we are delight, uh, delighted to see all of you. For those of you joining us online, we welcome you back and know that you are part of this congregation wherever you're joining us from. You are welcomed in the name of Christ and in the spirit of love and grace in this place. For those of you who are in the sanctuary this morning, if you would find one of those friendship pads and let us know you're here, especially if you might be visiting with us, let us know how we can contact you to continue a conversation about what God is doing in this place through the people called Benson Memorial UMC. Also, as we begin our new year, our activities are starting up, so I encourage you to look at the, uh, the beacon uh, for more information, but of particular interest, our Bible studies are beginning again, and on Wednesday evening, January the 11th, we will have uh, the resumption of our fellowship meal, Wonderful Wednesdays. The meal is served at 545, and you're invited to bring a covered dish and Enjoy that uh, for an hour of fellowship, followed by a Bible study beginning at 645. And then uh, Thursday mornings, we began again uh, this uh, past Thursday. We will continue in the Thursdays coming up. And so you're invited to any of those Bible studies and all of them and uh, other activities as may be of interest and need. But do check the beacon uh, for more information and uh, the church calendar. And so on this Sunday in which we celebrate the baptism of our Lord and we reaffirm our very own baptisms, we know that the Spirit of God is in this place and you are welcome here. Let us join into worship with great gladness, great anticipation, and great joy. Amen. Please rise on your feet or in your hearts and join me in the greeting. Come to the water, be refreshed in its endless flow. We come with eager hearts and ready souls. Enter into the water that saves. The gifts of God are without end. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters, on page 605 of the hymnal.
Please join me in the opening prayer. O oh God, your spirit once moved over the waters, and with but a word you brought forth all life across the cosmos. The miracle of your love continues with the birth of Christ and the gift of his grace shared in the life-giving waters of baptism. As we worship you today, wash us clean and make our hearts holy. In Christ we pray, amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah 42, 1 through 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am God, the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Anthony and Choir. That's one of my favorite songs. and you did it beautifully. And thank you for making the effort to sing through the mask because I know that's not easy to do. So uh, extra, extra effort today, but thank you so much. Our young people, you want to come forward? We've got some two friends here. Anybody else? Come on. How are you? You can come right on here. You can sit on the floor. There you go. That's a good place. Come there. How are you? I love your boots. Shiny boots. Everybody look at these boots sometime today. You have to see the shine. You've got some brown ones on. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. Get those ready. Well, let me ask you something. Do you have a bath time? Do you have a certain time every day you have to take a bath? What time is it? Before bedtime? Yeah. When I was little, like you, when I was even a little older, I had a certain bath time that I had to be uh, bathed and in my pajamas and then ready for bed. And it was something we did. But when I went and stayed with relatives a lot of times, and I had a great aunt who let me stay up late. And what we did, there was a man on TV in those days named Johnny Carson. You don't, y'all don't know who Johnny Carson is, but everybody else here does. And she would let me stay up and watch Johnny Carson. And so that was something I always looked forward to. But I had to have my bath first. So I had to take a bath. Well, one day, I was staying with her one night, and she asked me, she said, Alan, have you had your bath? And I, I had. And she said, well, let me see. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, come over here and let me see your arms and legs. So I went, and she said, what are those brown and dark spots on your elbows. I was like, well, those are, Auntie, those are bruises. She said, come with me. And she took me out to, in a wash pot, and in those days, the ladies in my family made their own soap. They made what they called lye soap. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And she scrubbed me down with a bar, of, and it came in these big chunks, and it didn't look like what we buy in the stores. And, and she scrubbed me down and she scrubbed those bruises right off my elbow. And to that day, it's a joke in our family. Not too many people know that story anymore, but it's a joke, scrubbing the bruises off. And that was what the lye soap did. And it made me clean, and then I got to watch Johnny Carson. So um, today we're going to talk about another sort of bath. See the water? There's water in here. And we are going to talk about baptism. Baptism. And baptism is a kind of bath that God gives us that washes away all of our bruises and all of the things that might stain us and makes us beautifully brilliant in his light. And so when you hear about baptism today, think bath. God's giving us a bath. And God's giving us not just any bath. He's washing us, thank goodness, not with lye soap. But he's washing us with his love and his grace. And that's something that can sustain us forever. So let's pray for a minute. Dear God, we thank you for loving us and giving us the gift of baptism. We love you, God. Amen. All right. See you, see you soon. You got shiny shoes on too. I couldn't see your shoes earlier. Those are beautiful. Well, our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. In the third chapter, beginning with the 13th verse, we do hear about the baptism of Jesus. So now let us receive a living word from a living God. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you? Come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. But when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, 
Suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And this too, friends, is the Word of God given to us, God's people. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. Holy and gracious God, On this day when we do celebrate the baptism of our Lord and remember our own baptisms, we are given hope in the memory of your love and your grace. Lord, now as we prepare to hear your word, walk among us, touch us, help us to hear and be transformed by the word given. Lord, in all things, may this preacher speak truth. And may we proclaim love and light in all that we say and in all that we do. Lord, speak now. Your servants are gathered. We are listening. We are eager to hear. Servant, now speak, Lord. We proclaim this. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My mother tells the story in one of her books on the sacrament. Of the years and years and, yeah, even some more years, she spent researching and writing her doctoral dissertation on the theology and the practice of baptism among American Methodists. And my grandmother, her mother, I I can remember, I was actually sitting there with them when this conversation happened, but she writes about it in, in a book. And maybe this was more than one conversation. It probably happened several times, but I can remember the time, uh, maybe the first time that it happened, that my grandmother was frustrated with the amount of time that all the research and all the writing was taking. And she asked my mother, what could be taking so long? Is baptism really that important? Well, my grandmother was not a theologically ignorant person. She was a child of the church. She had grown to be one of the central matriarchs of our small town Christian Methodist community. She had likely attended, I know she had attended my baptism, my sister's baptism, and hundreds of others by the time she asked my mother about the sacrament. So I believe that her question was sincerely asked and the answer not presumed. She really did not know the answer. Now, I don't remember my mother's exact reply, although I expect it was some version of the one she offers to readers of her books. But despite her wisdom, even though miles and miles and miles of pages have been written by her and others on this particular subject, I expect that still many of us, none of us who are theologically ignorant either or who, and who have been faithfully present in churches for more years than many of us would like to count, are also left with the question that my grandmother had. Is baptism really that important? Well, again, it's a good question to consider these days, especially when Many are questioning the validity of Methodist theology and the worth of United Methodist polity. And my mother taught that baptism connects us to every other aspect of Christian faith. It reveals the nature and purpose of God, makes clear our nature as human beings. It is part of the process of salvation that which initiates us into the church and enables us to face our own deaths with assurance. Or to put it more simply, in baptism, the gospel is heard, seen, and felt. Yeah, mom knew her stuff. And we can say with confidence, yes, baptism is important. We know this now. But anyone who reads the text from Matthew today also knows about the importance of baptism. 
Baptism is important to us because it is important to Jesus. Jesus accompanies some of the large crowds out to find John at the Jordan River. And when our Lord arrives, he presents himself ready for baptism. And that must have been quite a shock for John. In fact, John is so taken aback that he initially refuses to do the baptism, telling the man from Galilee that their roles should be reversed. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus is not deterred, you know. Jesus persists. His desire for baptism has indeed puzzled generations of scholars and confused Christians like us for a long time. After all, we know Jesus doesn't need to be baptized. He is sinless. And yet he considers the act of baptism to be important enough that he has intentionally gone out. He doesn't just wander through the wilderness and stumble upon the Jordan River and what John's doing there. He has intentionally ventured out through the wilderness to reach the Jordan so that he can walk down its muddy banks and enter into its green waters, just like any one of the hundreds of others who have made this identical trip. uh, Jesus tells cousin John, let it be so now, for it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Let me, if you will, break down that sentence just a bit, so that we don't miss the full meaning of what Jesus is saying here. Notice first that Jesus says, let it be so now. Let it be so now. In other words, there is going to be more to this story. John baptizes with water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The water is merely an outward sign of grace that is growing in the heart. The water is an outward sign of God's internal work. The water, as we know, is something we can touch. The water is an assurance. It is a channel that we can see through which we grow in holiness. Baptism is a milestone on a longer journey toward perfection. But the way of salvation doesn't end at the river. This font is not the final destination we will reach. Jesus then is saying to John, I know that I don't need this baptism, but you do. All these other people do need it. So let me show you the way. Let me tell you the truth. Let me demonstrate the life that I want you to live. Let you please know that I'm with you now and in the age to come. It might not make sense to you now, but don't worry. It makes sense to me. God's got this. That's an assuring word. But look at what Jesus tells us next. Let's look specifically at two words that Jesus uses as he continues to reply to John. Jesus first speaks of righteousness. Righteousness. Now, when we hear the word righteousness, we typically think of it referencing morality or uprightness. But Jesus here is not speaking only of morality with this word, but he is also emphasizing the will of God manifested in the existence of a right and perfect relationship found between the persons of the Trinity, the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the unfolding relationship that exists between and among God's children. Jesus, in other words, speaks of togetherness, life together. Being together is the will of God. Jesus speaks of his desire not so much for a particular ritual, but he speaks of his longing for solidarity, for us to be together, 
with those who need to be baptized. When Jesus enters into the cooling waters of the Jordan, he is sharing a holy gift, binding us together, not only with one another, but also with God Almighty. Jesus reminds us that God's love remains. It remains steadfast and always available. No matter how far we have strayed, no matter what we thought in days past, regardless of how deep the ditch is that we fell into when we lost our way, God still loves you. God still loves us. God still wants to be with us. Maybe even when we don't want to be with ourselves. God may have found us in a low place, but thank God that He didn't leave us where He found us. Praise God. Remember, God loves you. God always will. And this is wonderful testimony. But like the guy on the infomercial, wait, there's more. There's more. You see, Jesus doesn't just speak of righteousness in general. He, he's not offering some theological truth. Jesus also shows us the way that we enter into the relationship he offers. He doesn't just let us flounder around until we figure it out. He shows us the way. Now, don't miss this. Jesus says his actions that day in the Jordan are to fulfill all righteousness. And that word fulfill, we ought not to gloss over. We ought not to take it for granted. The word fulfill here means to be full, to fill up. But to put it plainly, fulfill means to complete something, to complete it. And so when Jesus enters the waters of a river running through the wilderness, when he shocks John with his unexpected request, he demonstrates the sort of love necessary to bring about holy relationship, a relationship that means something, that is endlessly enduring, that is always life. He's not just telling us about the relationship. Jesus shows us the way into it, and we follow suit. Now, this should, this should blow our minds if we will think about it. Jesus, the Son of God, perfect, without blemish, with no darkness in him. Yet yeah, he goes. He's all that. But yet he goes where sinners go to do what sinners must. Paul tells us about the mind of Christ when he writes to the Philippians, telling us that though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking a form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. To say it another way, Jesus gave up everything he had to be with us. He gave up everything because there is nothing Jesus loves more than us. And he didn't just say, I love you. He showed up for us. He shared the love of God with each of us. The very Spirit of God descends as the waters drip from Jesus' body. And a voice from heaven says, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And so then, back to Paul, God highly exalted him, gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Only that sort of love can lift us from sin. That is the power and the promise of Jesus' love. Now we're hearing some good news now, and I'm thankful for it. But let me offer one final point before I'm done this morning. Remember, Jesus stands in solidarity with us in baptism. Jesus shares God's love with us in this holy moment. 
And now, because of all that, in ways that, yes, we sometimes struggle to explain, but which we surely know, we are made ready. We are made able to love God in the world in which we live. Baptism is not an exit strategy from the world. We don't get lifted into the sweet by and by out of baptism. Instead, baptism is a particular way that we know, that we learn, that we experience, so that we can be present, fully present in the world. I don't have to tell you this. But living in the world is a hard thing to do. The world has a constant appetite to make us forget God, to drop love, and to live in unholy ways. And that's one reason we affirm our baptism. United Methodists do not rebaptize anyone. God gets it right the first time. No matter when you are baptized, adult, as an infant, whenever. God gets it right. But we do, on occasion, remind ourselves of the promises made at the baptismal font. In a few minutes, you all will be invited to come forth, to touch these waters, take a shell, and remember your own baptism. But more than the ritual, because many of us can't remember our baptism, We were baptized as infants. I was. I don't remember a thing about that. Don't remember a thing. But we are encouraged to remember the promises of love inherent in baptism. Do we renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world? Resist evil, injustice, and oppression? Do we confess Jesus as our Lord? These are the ways that we love God in a troubled world. These are the habits by which we will love all of our neighbors. These promises are the way of life for those who hear Jesus' call and follow him. During Epiphany, this season that we enter into today and that we will follow up uh, through the weeks until we reach Ash Wednesday, We are emphasizing the theme, we are called. We are called. And the baptismal vows that we make to renounce and reject and resist evil and confess Jesus are to what we are called. None of us are called, not all of us are called to live out our promises in the exact same way. Within the beautiful diversity of our individual calls, working together for God's glory, we can do what Jesus directs. We can find it later in Matthew. You know these words. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I, Jesus, have commanded. In this holy way, we are empowered to live in the world, but we ought not to be of the world because we are God's own beloved, set apart as followers of Christ, living as children of the Holy Spirit. And so today we will remember our baptisms and we will be thankful for God's grace. Today we will recommit to being disciples. And today we will reconnect inside the holy relationship in which we are invited with God and with each other. Yesterday, church, let's love God by wading in the water, by following Christ's call. Glory to God. Amen. Now, having heard the word proclaimed, I invite you to stand as you're able as we profess together what it is we believe using this morning a modern affirmation that will be found in your uh, United Methodist hymnals on page 885, 885, a modern affirmation.
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom and power and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ, and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord. To the end, that kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. As we gather this morning, we gather also for prayer. It's one of the true gifts of the church and one of the tr true privileges we get to share with one another. And so I invite you into a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, God of the Exodus promises, God of David and Israel, God with the nation in exile, God who called the prophets, God who sent your Son into the world, and God who sent your Spirit to follow. You are the God we pray to with praise and joy this morning. We gather with gratitude in our hearts today. We live with love for each other and above all for you. Bless us, Holy Lord, today and in the days ahead. Father in heaven, we pray that you will increasingly reveal Jesus to us during this season of Epiphany. Help us to hear the sweet call of Jesus to follow him as we learn to be faithful disciples and share the good news wherever we go. Let our lives testify to the redeeming power you shared through Christ and let the fruits of your spirit shine through us and be apparent in all that we say and in everything we do. During the season when your word is revealed to us again, may we decrease so that Christ increases. God of yesterday and today, you are surely the God of tomorrow. As we enter into a new year, free our vision and make it bold so that we are focused not on what we think we can do, but we are concentrating on what it is you are already doing among us and through us and what you will yet do in the future that belongs most assuredly to you. Let us not be timid in either thought or action, but may our witness proclaim Christ in all things. Make a way when we see no way. Give us courage when we are afraid. Humble us when we become arrogant. Give us compassion in the face of need. Make us welcoming when the world wants to shut out and exclude. May we always speak your truth of liberation. God, always guide us.
be beside us and show us the way. It, in, it is in the waters of baptism that you claim us and show us your eternal love. Let us remember your promises to us today, and also let us recall the commitments we have made in your name. Today we celebrate your grace and love. And so we pray this in all things in Jesus' name, and with great joy for what Jesus gives, let us pray the prayer that he did indeed give us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we who have heard the word, we who have prayed together are one body. Including those of you joining us online, we are one in God's Holy Spirit. And so I invite you to stand now as you're able and greet your neighbor with the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. The grace, the peace, the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. Each week we gather and we give. And in a few weeks, uh, I'm going to ask Alan Teal to give a financial update. He's kind of taking a month off. Um, no. <laughs> but Alan, we're, we're thrilled to see you back and doing so well. We've been praying for you, oh, as well as many of you others who have been sick, so sick over the Christmas uh, period. I was glad to see many people back. But Alan will give a, a financial report, a year-end financial report. But let me preview just a bit to say it is an encouraging picture. It is an improved picture from even the last time you heard a report. And it's certainly a uh, much improved picture from what it was uh, six to eight months ago. Uh, and so we, we give thanks for that. We give thanks for your generosity. But as we do turn a new year, we still have mission and ministry to do. And we still need your generosity. What you give supports the work of this church. But more importantly, what you give glorifies God and helps you live out these baptismal promises that we have made. And so, if the ushers come by, I urge you to give generously. And if you don't give today, you may give online or in the mail. So many ways that many of you, all of you, are supporting this church, and glorifying God, and we give thanks. Amen.
Father God, as we stand here before the waters of baptism, please accept these gifts. We are grateful for the people's generosity, but it is a mere reflection of your own generosity. The salvation that you give us, the love you give us, the grace you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ. So as we touch these waters, as we give these gifts, may your Spirit multiply and magnify within us. Take these gifts and make them larger than us and use them for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. We come now to reaffirm, to remember our baptisms. And I realize there may be people in our midst who are not baptized. If that is the case, you are also welcome to come forward, to touch these waters, to anticipate your baptism. God loves you, remember? Jesus is calling you. The Spirit is real in your life. And so if you're not baptized, we invite you to come forward. And we invite you to prayerfully consider being baptized. If there's any among us who are not, I would invite you to come talk with me. And we will prayerfully discern a path forward. If you are at home or some other place watching online, you may gather a small container of water and touch it as everyone is invited to come forward and remember your own baptism. Yes, we are grateful today. And so I invite those who are here to turn in your hymnals to page 50. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of our baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this, is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism. We acknowledge what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. And so now I'm going to ask you on behalf of the whole church, and when you hear that term, the whole church, and you read it, think about who's around you, but also think broader. There is a great cloud of witnesses, the communion of saints all around us, and they are part of this great reaffirmation too. The whole church includes all of those who have walked in an unbroken line from the time of Jesus until we reach today. All those saints, all those prophets, all those foremothers and forefathers of the early church, the foremothers and forefathers, those desert dwellers who gave us great wisdom and that we still use today, those disciples of Jesus Christ who have grown the faith from a small gathering in Jerusalem out to Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That is the whole church. And when you think and you look around, remember those who are here who are no longer with us, either who have departed to the church triumphant or because of illness or some other reason cannot be here. They are the whole church. You, beloved, are the whole church. And so on behalf of that whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? 
Now, friends, I invite you to stand as we once again profess together the Christian faith that is contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. Let me ask you this. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ. Son of the Son of the Holy Spirit. by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters, and you brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water, and the flood you set in the, in the after the flood you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of God's mercy. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John, anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations, declare his works to the nations, his glory among all people. Pour out your Holy Spirit by this gift of water. Call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our own baptism. For you have washed away our sins, and you clothe us with righteousness throughout our lives, that dying and rising with Christ, you may share, we all may share, in your complete and final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. And now I invite you to come forward to one of these fonts. Come forward as you're able. Simply form a line. Choir, if you may come forward as well. Touch the waters. Remember your baptism. Take a shell as a symbol of your remembrance. Remember your baptism. Thank mm -hmm. you. Spirit work within you, that having been born by water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism. Be thankful. Remember your baptism. Proclaim the good news. Be thankful. Remember your baptism. Be thankful. Let the Holy Spirit work within you. Having been born by water and the Spirit, you may live always faithfully as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be thankful. 
remember your baptism. Proclaim the good news. Be thankful. Give thanks to God for His love and grace. Let the Holy Spirit work within you, having been born by water and the Spirit. You may live faithfully as a disciple of our Lord. Remember your baptism. Be thankful for it. Remember your baptism. the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born by water and the Spirit, you may live faithfully from this day forward as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Remember your baptism. Proclaim the good news. Let it be real in your life. Give thanks. Remember your baptism. Be thankful. Remember your baptism. Let the Holy Spirit work within you. All who have been born by water and the Spirit, live faithfully as a disciple of Jesus Christ the rest of your days. Remember your baptism. Be thankful for it. Remember, remember with joy your baptism. Be thankful. Let us rejoice in the faithfulness of our covenant God. We give thanks for all that God has already given us as members of the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We will faithfully participate in the ministries of our church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And the grace, the God of all grace, who has called us into eternal glory in Christ, establish and strengthen us by the power of his Holy Spirit, so that we may live in grace, peace, and truth. Amen. I invite you to stand now and sing with great joy our closing hymn, number 420, Breathe on Me, Breath.
Yes, let the breath of God flow on us. Breathe on us, breath of God. Give us hope. Give us joy. Give us peace. As you depart today and you take one of these shells, I would invite you to place it somewhere in your life where you can see it day by day. Maybe in your kitchen, maybe in your office, maybe in your bedroom. And remember, each time you see it, the love God has for you. Let that love, let that promise encourage you, sustain you, and keep you all the days ahead. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace.